Uh, thank you, Seth. Um, so, hi, we're from uh, u.com, and today we're going to be talking about uh, transformer models at scale and some open challenges in search. Uh, we're your talkers today. I'm Sam Bean. I'm a software engineer at u.com. Uh, I work in a lot of our data and machine learning infrastructure. And I'm Sahil. Um, I'm an engineer at u.com as well, where I've kind of been focusing a lot broadly on search and search infrastructure. I guess really quick, can can everyone see the presentation? Sahil, can you see it just fine? Yep, we're good. Great. So to kind of go over the agenda, we're going to start off talking about how we use transformers at u.com. We're going to talk a little bit about technology choices, why we chose Hugging Face and Apache Spark for running uh, machine learning ETLs with transformers. We're going to talk about massive parallel batching with the Pandas UDF in Spark. And then we're going to kind of go talk about increasing throughput with the Onyx runtime and then some uh, special type of setups you have to do for running on Onyx runtime inference sessions in a Spark setting. I'm going to talk, go, do a quick overview, uh, give some quick tips, and uh, go over some future work for how to do this, how we think we could do this better. And then uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sahil to talk a little bit more about the retrieval side of things, talk about search applications and concepts, and then uh, a little bit about the future of search. So the first part of this talk is going to be a, a little bit more nuts and bolts about getting vectors and putting them into somewhere we can retrieve them. And then the second half of this talk is going to be around open problems and the general retrieval side of things. And then we're going to end with Q&A. So um, we won't be taking questions throughout the talk. We're going to hold that till the end. Um, and so quickly to give an overview of u.com, u.com is a search engine. You control your sources, your time, your privacy, uh, founded uh, as Seth kind of alluded to by top researchers in NLP, Richard Socher and Brian McCann. Um, we give our users a control over the search experience through a number of personalization tools. And we kind of partition our search into a number of apps that we show on the search results page. And then we give you a zero trace private mode, which means the no logs, no telemetry. It's completely dark with just one click. So, um, Sal, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the search applications at you? Yeah. So we take a different approach to search where we essentially are solving various information retrieval problems in different domains corresponding to what we call apps. Um, and we power our own search across these domains, which are reflected by our diverse set of apps spanning categories like programming sites to public forums. Um, so you can see some of the apps within some of these categories listed here. Um, and within the programming category, we built a variety of apps to power U code, our search engine for developers, with an emphasis on programming sites like Stack Overflow. Our apps are designed not only for search, but also for interaction with new features like programming language filtering. Um, we also have a variety of other categories and associated apps, just shopping apps, research apps, blogs, forum apps from, Medi from Medium to Reddit, among others. Um, and then broadly, overall, our goal is to really allow users to discover more in less time with our search and the way we kind of approach search in hopefully a unique way. Thank you. So uh, a little bit about transformers at u.com. Um, we have kind of been using transformers since the dawn of the company. Uh, the model is really woven into the DNA of our tech stack, and we use it across a variety of domains. So a few of those are semantic search, so uh, kind of cr using vector databases and performing nearest neighbor lookups to retrieve documents for our users. Uh, we use, it, use them for a number of classification tasks, which are trained via transfer learning. We have some causal language modeling, which generates natural language and code for our users, which we'll show you in a second. And then for some of our uh, deep ranking tasks, we again use transfer learning using transformer models. Uh, so you can see that we kind of, these models are more or less ubiquitous across our tech stack. And we found that they're uh, basically best in class for any of these tasks that require natural language processing. So a quick kind of uh, demonstration of some of the generative technologies that were introduced into the site. You can see a few of these kind of code complete apps, uh, specifically for Apache Spark, Kubernetes, and Regex. You can input uh, natural language uh, descriptions of what you're trying to do in your code. And we use um, very large language models to kind of generate the commands that um, uh, will perform these for you. And so really nice aspect of these is that they kind of go beyond summarization tools, which you might see on other search engines, and kind of customize what the outputs of these commands look like specifically to what your prompt does. So uh, if you're interested in, in using these types of tools, you can go find them on our site right now. Um, but 
for the majority of this talk, we're going to be talking about um, semantic search. And uh, right here, you can see a overview of the pretty standard semantic search architecture, uh, which we're going to go over. Um, so on the left side, we have a number of pieces of software that go out to the internet, they crawl, they go and get documents in a very unstructured way, they kind of put that somewhere. Um, for us, it's a data lake, pretty standard, but could be a number of different storage tools. From there, we have a number of kind of enrichment steps in the form of ETLs that, you know, parse out unstructured data, put it into like columnar formats, and then perform um, some machine learning tasks on them to enrich that data. And then uh, as the output of some of those are kind of feature representations or embeddings or ve vectors of those documents, we uh, index those into a database or a vector database, which on the other side, we have users who make a natural language query to our website. We embed that again using Hugging Face, and then we perform uh, an approximate nearest neighbor lookup using the output of that vector. The output of that nearest neighbor search is returned as documents to our users. Um, one quick thing is that this is only one aspect of search at u.com. We have a, a myriad of different ways that we do retrieval, um, but specifically for this talk, we're gonna be talking about uh, semantic search. And I know what you're thinking, Sam, this, this looks so easy. Um, why doesn't everyone do it? And uh, we're going to spend a bit of the talk uh, going through this, uh, this box in the bottom left ETL, and we're going to talk in length at some of the challenges that, that uh, show up uh, in the process of taking your text data and getting vectors out of them and subsequently indexing them. So um, a little bit about uh, our technology choices. So why did we pick Apache Spark for our ETL tool? Um, a big thing for us is fault tolerance crashes that involve machine learning models like this are really expensive to recover from, um, which means that if you're not using a tool like this, you have to write checkpointing logic and that checkpointing logic can be difficult to write. And so we kind of uh, delegate that uh, complexity into Apache Spark. Uh, Apache Spark is known for its lightning fast processing time. Um, using models like this can take a long time to push to get vectors out of. And so uh, we, we need to improve the processing time so that we can process you know, billions of documents and get vectors out of them. And then scaling difficulties, kind of scaling ongoing inference jobs can be a challenge. And so we leverage a number of tools within Apache Spark to allow us to very elastically, horizontally scale these jobs as they are ongoing, if we need them to finish sooner than um, we forecast that they might. Um, and uh, why do we choose Hugging Face? Um, I'd say by far the lowest barrier of entry to using language models, transformers specifically, using the transformers library, um, really great APIs and documentation. They have very efficient tokenization libraries uh, written in Rust, and they have a number of really nice auxiliary libraries like the Optimum that allow you to kind of seamlessly take your PyTorch models in Hugging Face and convert them to like an Onyx format and then run a number of hardware optimizations that can kind of increase the throughput of inference jobs. Um, and all these together make it, a, make it a pretty easy choice for us to go with Hugging Face. We're gonna talk, be talking a little bit more about the Optimum library and its use and interaction with the Pipelines API uh, in a little bit. Um, but this is how we more or less arrived at these technology choices. And we're gonna now talk about how we combine them together to run these machine learning ETLs. Um, uh, to do that, we're gonna have to talk a little bit about Apache Spark and the way that um, Apache Spark does parallelism. Um, and so the first thing that Apache Spark does is it kind of takes all of your data and it breaks it down into pieces that, you know, can fit into memory on a Spark worker node. Um, those, uh, the Spark job is comprised of stages and those stages are themselves comprised of tasks. The, the task being the atomic unit of work within Apache uh, Spark. Um, we get these partitions through a shuffle operation, which basically takes all the data and shuffles it and then maps it to a partition, which uh, are then picked up by a task. And when that unit of work is complete, that checkpoint is logged with the Apache Spark driver node. And um, that is uh, the unit of kind of fault tolerance here. So if one of those tasks for a partition fail, Apache Spark will automatically retry that. 
And so this enables a, a really high level of fault tolerance where you can write your code and just let Apache Spark handle retrying things. Um, and again, when these tasks are finished, that is usually when this checkpointing logic happens. So a few kind of rules of thumb for, for this portion of the, of the talk is that um, these partitions are, um, because if they fail, they have to be retried from the beginning. You might be kind of um, tempted to say, we're gonna make a ton of partitions and we're just gonna make them very, very tiny. However, this can lead to a large number of shuffles, which can increase the number of wait time being done by the CPU, which can kind of lower the throughput of your job. And if you don't have enough partitions, then one failure means that you're going to have to retry a very large amount of data and reprocess that. And so we usually aim for around 250 megabytes for each partition. Um, and then as part of that, you can kind of repartition your data and you can use another configuration option as the SQL shuffle partitions um, and make sure that those are more or less aligned. Um, after we've done this partitioning, uh, we need to actually process this data, which we are leveraging the pandas UDF, um, which basically what this does is once you have your data partitioned, um, the pandas UDF will um, marshal your data from the Spark JVM into a um, into batches using the Apache Arrow, and this kind of gets it into the the Python runtime. Um, we use these pandas UDF because historically the the legacy Spark UDFs, which you would use to just run whatever code you want to, so really tempting to use that as your unit of processing for um, running your transformer model within. But because those UDFs are row wise, you end up doing batches of one, which the, the hugging face inference APIs are really meant to do batches. And so this allows you to kind of chunk up the partitions into batches and then push those batches through the, the hugging face model at once. Um, so this system allows you a number of kind of configurable options that you can tune to increase the number of parallelism to max out the, the throughput of your system. Um, the, the configuration option here that you're going to be looking for is the max records per batch, which kind of dictates how big those arrow batches that you push through the pandas UDF all at once um, are. And so you want that to be about as large as possible to maximize your memory um, so you can kind of in parallel run those batches and as large a forward passes as possible. Um, for tuning these jobs as you kind of develop them, you're gonna be heavily relying on what's known as the Ganglia UI, which is your monitoring tool for um, figuring out how these Spark jobs um, are, are using their resources. And so as you develop these machine learning ETLs, you usually are going to have that up, kind of making sure that um, your inference jobs are maximizing the, the resources on the machine. And so kind of really quickly, what an unhealthy Spark cluster running one of these jobs looks like is, is this. Um, you can see in the bottom left that light orange color is the CPU wait time, which means the system is shuffling around a lot of data, trying to push, the, push it through um, your hugging face models. And then top right, you can see that we're spilling a lot of memory to swap, which is on disk, which can cause your job to fail, which is um, because these jobs take such a long time to run, um, means you're going to have to restart. And so kind of a healthier look at this is, is this. Um, everything is more or less even keel. The, the system is just sitting here processing. We would love our CPU to be closer to 100%, but um, this is more or less what you're looking for when you're, when you're writing one of these large ETLs, which is just kind of the whole system is spending all of its time just processing data. So... Um, this is kind of like an overview of how to maximize your parallelism with, within Apache Spark. But if you need your, your jobs to go faster, if you're not getting the throughput and processing enough of those documents in your machine learning ETL, then really the only recourse you have is actually improve the throughput of those pandas UDFs, which are actually running your inference code. And so the next part of this talk is going to be about kind of how we, how we speed up those pandas UDFs mostly around converting the, the inference within those uh, UDFs, which I guess I should have said this earlier, UDF is a user-defined function, basically allows you to run user code within um, the Spark uh, MapReduce framework. 
Um, and so the way that we do that is via the Onyx runtime. So quick overview, Onyx is the open neural network exchange. And so this is a file format for neural networks, which allows you to kind of serial out, serialize out a neural network and then run it on a number of different um, hardware devices. On top of this, Microsoft built the Onyx runtime or ORT, which is a machine learning runtime, which leverages Onyx to run kind of uh, optimized inference jobs. Um, and we've seen regularly about two to three X speed ups of using the Onyx uh, inference uh, compared to a like a, a, Py, a PyTorch um, model, which is what Hugging Face uses under the hood, unless you're using the TensorFlow API. Um, and so Hugging Face gives us a number of tools via the optimum library to kind of take our, our PyTorch transformer model and convert it uh, to Onyx for use with the Onyx runtime. Uh, this is done via the optimum library. And the really nice thing about this is that uh, the, the go-to API for doing inference within Hugging Face is the pipelines API. And the way that Optimum is written is that you can kind of swap out your PyTorch model with an Onyx runtime inference session, and that pipeline API will work exactly the same. So your inference code does not change. However, you get a, a large amount of uh, throughput increase using the, the ORT models. Um, on top of this, I said before that you can get about two to three X speed up running on Onyx runtime, you can do subsequent optimizations, uh, either quantization um, to kind of you know decrease the uh, the precision of the neural network, um, or you can use graph optimizations like constant folding um, or higher level optimizations like your level two and level ninety nine graph optimizations within the Onyx runtime um, to get further speed ups. However, quick call out there is that if you are using a level two or 99 uh, graph optimization in Onyx runtime, those are hardware dependent. And so you can't really run those optimizations on one type of machine and then put them somewhere like a model registry and then pull them from there and run inference on a different type of machine. That's it's not going to work for you. So really, you need to run those optimizations on the same machine that um, that you're going to be doing inference on because the Onyx runtime will kind of look around at what the hardware is and then do optimizations based on that. Um, and so what you might be thinking is that this is great. We can use the same. Our inference code doesn't have to change. Our, our Spark code doesn't have to change. We just swap out for Onyx and we put that in our UDF and everything is going to be great. We get 3x speed up and we're going to go about our day. Um, but there is a bit of a snag. Um, you will run into an error like this. You cannot pickle the Onyx runtime inference session, um, probably because it's interacting directly with the, the C APIs. Um, but this is kind of a known issue with the Onyx runtime. You can find GitHub issues if you want to kind of read more into how people are working around this. Um, but you kind of run into uh, a little bit of an issue here where PySpark uses pickling to transmit UDF code to workers. The workers kind of suck up the data. And then the driver node kind of pushes code to those workers to execute on the data and then kind of sends back checkpoints to the, to the driver node. So we need to pickle the code to send to the workers. However, these ORT inference sections, they cannot be pickled. And so you seem to kind of be in a bit of a quagmire. And so at u.com, the way we get around this is via a, a file broadcast system, which looks a little bit like this. Um, so you can't create one of these Onyx runtime inference sessions and then reference it outside of the Pandas UDF. So really the only way to get around that is to kind of construct that, that data structure within the Pandas UDF. And so the way that we do that is that we, we load our Hugging Face model from the Hugging Face Hub and we do our Onyx conversions. We run our, either our quantization, our graph optimizations on the Spark driver node, which produces our uh, quantize or optimize Onyx file. And then we use the Spark add files API to kind of broadcast that down to the worker nodes. And then within the worker, within on the worker nodes, they can kind of ask using the Spark files API, kind of like, do I have something called a uh, optimized Onyx file? And then that, that API will say, yes, it's, it's right here, um, located on the actual worker nodes disk. And then you can kind of load that in and then run your inference. Now there is a bit of a trade-off here because there is an IO penalty 
around, you know, you have to actually load this from disk and you have to construct that data structure uh, before you run inference. Um, however, as we said before, with like a two to three X speed up using Onyx and then even more throughput increases if you do quantization or graph optimizations, um, that one-time penalty, which you will pay per arrow batch. So that kind of becomes another um, variable in your calculus of how do you tweak all of these different configuration options in your NLP ETLs. Um, we usually have found that paying that, that IO penalty per arrow batch easily gets repaid by the, the improved throughput of the Onyx runtime inference session. And so we use this type of, of system like this, where um, as part of the startup, we create our machine learning artifact, we broadcast it, and then within our user-defined functions, we load that in, process the data, and then repeat. Um, and this works really great. Um, we have we have kind of the the improved throughput that we were looking for um, past this. Uh, really, the only way to kind of improve your 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 optimization or your throughput on the ETL is to kind of increase the number of workers or to um, or to find uh, ways to kind of do better Onyx optimizations based on your hardware or find better or more conducive hardware for, for your model. Um, and so kind of to get a little bit into the code, give you a little uh, taste of what this looks like in code, um, quantizing using the Optimum API is really easy. Um, here I'm using one of the built-in Stilbert based on case models. You were using feature extraction because we just want to get vectors out of the top, um, the pooled head. Uh, we get an ORT quantizer, and then we pass in that Onyx runtime model used for feature extraction. We tell it what kind of hardware we're using, which uh, to, to, to specifically call this out, this is all using CPU hardware, which is obviously much cheaper than, than trying to run these, these inference jobs on GPU and allow a lot more horizontal scalability because you don't have to go find more GPUs, which for a while were pretty hard to find in the cloud. Um, and, uh, and so we tell it you're on an ARM64 CPU, um, because we don't actually know what kind of data is going to be coming in. We can't do static quantization, which quantizes based on a pre, uh, predefined data sets. We do dynamic quantization. Um, we save that out using the quantization config, using the quantize. And then, uh, next we'll take a look at broadcasting. Super easy. You just reference that quantized file that you just generated, and then the hugging face config, which is just a JSON file on, on disk. You broadcast that out to all the worker nodes with the, the add file API like this. Um, very easy to do. And then finally, actually looking at execution of the pandas UDF looks more or less like this. So you tell the, the UDF this is the file you're looking for. Um, use the Spark Files API to say, hey, do I have something called this on my, on my machine? Spark Files will say, yes, here it is. You load that in. Uh, you get your ORT model for feature extraction. You construct your transformer pipeline like this. And then there's a little bit of marshalling data because the inputs and outputs of these Pandas UDFs are Pandas series or um, Pandas data frames, which um, the pipelines API does not you know, take out of the box, you just convert it to a list. And then you push all of that text through your, um, your feature extraction pipeline. And then as the output, you get an array of floats, which is your, your feature uh, representation. And then you kind of append that to your data frame as uh, shown on the last line. I made this a higher order function because sometimes you want to pass in different parameters to tweak how you're running um, the, the, inner, the inner code, the run pipeline code, which you could pass in in the get pipeline UDF. Um, but here it's just a it's just a call with no parameters, um, and so this is this is more or less what it looks like. Um, there's obviously a lot of code around this, but these are kind of like the the core pieces that allow us to run hugging face models at scale in Apache Spark. Um, we can we can get up to thousands of documents processed per second on a pretty modestly sized um, CPU Spark cluster. And the nice thing about this is that because of the horizontal scalability. If we 10x the cluster size, we could 10x the number of documents that we process up to tens of thousands of documents per second, which allows us to process through you know, billions of documents and get feature representations out of them all. Um, and so that's more or less all for, for my part of the talk. Quick overview, we use Hugging Face for the easy to use APIs, access to state-of-the-art models and some of the auxiliary libraries like Optimum for neural network optimization. 
And then we use Apache Spark for massive parallel compute, uh, specifically using the pandas UDF so that we get access to batches within um, those UDFs, which we can push through our um, transformer model. There's a ton of different configuration options to, to maximize the parallelism and to make sure that you're consuming all of the machine resources. Uh, use Ganglia a lot to Whoops, we, uh, we seem to have lost Sam from the session. Uh, I'll message him and see. Yeah, um, and he's controlling the slides. Do you happen to have them, uh, Sahil? Yeah, let me message him to see if I get the updated copies. One second. OK, sorry about that. He was doing the summary, but yeah. No idea what went on there. Okay, I see Sam back in. Let me promote him to panelist. I have, we're in webinar mode in case anyone didn't know. Uh, we have 119 attendees in addition to the speakers and me. Uh, and this helps us uh, avoid confusion. Uh, so Sam, you're gonna need to restart your share. Yep, I'm, I'm back. Yes. Um, I don't know what happened there. My, my computer couldn't take the awesomeness, awesomeness of this talk. Um, and so it, it, it crept out on me. Um, and so where I left off is that um, use Ganglia liberally to maximize those resources. Um, if you need extra throughput using Onyx conversion, even though you have to jump through some hoops, um, can help to increase the throughput of those jobs. Um, using quantization or optimization can help even more. There's a ton of different options around quantization um, and graph optimization that uh, the Optimum library gives you access to. Um, some tips and tricks. Uh, usually I would start with small models for these jobs. If you start with like a billion parameter neural network, it's gonna be harder to tune than starting out small. So Deberta V3 extra small is a model that I would highly suggest using. It comes out of Microsoft. It's, the research is really around how to get the most out of less. So this kind of performs on par with some of the larger BERT models, but it only has like 20 million parameters. Um, use, uh, tune your, the number of partitions and the max records per batch to kind of maximize your parallelism. And Gangly is gonna be your best friend when you, when you write these, these machine learning ETLs because they can be kind of finicky to tune. And then if you, and if you aren't satisfied with the throughput, there's tons of different Onyx neural network optimizations. I invite you to kind of try them all out. Um, in the future, uh, I think it's possible that replacing the Onyx runtime with the Tensor runtime, which comes out of NVIDIA, could give even more throughput. It's known that if you're running on GPUs, um, if you ever wanted to move to a GPU ETL, Tensor RT is going to give you better performance than, than the Onyx runtime. And then uh, an auxiliary to this is using CUDF, which is a library that comes out of Rapids.ai. CUDF is kind of written to allow you to run GPU accelerated pandas UDFs. And so with these things combined, I think you're basically gonna be at the technological limits of what you can expect out of the throughput using like a, a running ETLs like this. Um, and that's it for my talk. Uh, so that is how to get vectors out of your data at scale. And then once you put them into a vector database, you have to kind of retrieve them. And for that part of the talk, I'm going to hand it over to Sahil. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, so, Basically, for this portion of the talk, we'll talk about the future of search and some open challenges. But before we get into this, we're going to quickly go over some search concepts just to define a common vocabulary. Um, so the first concept is classical information retrieval. In classical IR, we retrieve documents using traditional tools, such as an inverted index. Um, classical information retrieval is often characterized by being keyword-based. So for example, we often leverage TFIDF scores here, which basically stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. Essentially, if the term in a query is present in a document, and it's also somewhat infrequent across all documents. It'll have a high TF-IDF score. But in practice, um, BM25 scores, which are a fancier version of TF-IDF scores that take into account document length, work better. Um, so that said, neural advances over the last couple of years have introduced a ton of opportunities and questions. Um, and search pipelines often consist of retrieval and re-ranking stages. And we're going to review neural IR in terms of its impact on both retrieval and re-ranking. Um, and when it comes to retrieval, we can use neural models to retrieve documents. Um, but in order to be useful, two questions need to be answered. The first one is, can pre-trained language models improve retrieval? And the answer is yes. Um, so we can get around some of the limitations of classical IR as keyword-based approaches sometimes fail to capture semantics. And there's been kind of an explosion of research here, as you all are aware of, um, and kind of Sam touched on as well. 
around kind of natural language processing um, and modeling and embeddings. And then secondly, can we efficiently use such models over large corpuses? Um, and the answer is also yes now. So there's been many advances in approximate nearest neighbor search at scale, which basically allow for low latency retrieval from dense vector representations. And this is a lot of, this is kind of, Sam talked more than nuts and bolts of kind of how we go about doing this. But basically the idea is we embed a query and we embed each document and we can very quickly find similar documents to the query. Um, and I think, yeah, and there are also a variety of open source initiatives as well as companies that can abstract this infrastructure, um, which is kind of nice. And I think it's going to be kind of leading to a lot of change in how people kind of deploy search at scale in the coming years. And then next, we can likewise, oh, sorry, Sam, if you stay on that slide, we can likewise use neural models to re-rank documents. So this is the second stage in the retrieval re-ranking architecture. So assuming we've retrieved K documents, we can generate a score for each query document and then sort documents by score. Of note over here is there's a trade-off between latency and quality. So on the one side, there are a bunch of low latency approaches that leverage representation-based similarity methods, such as by encoders. So these can take advantage of like approximate nearest neighbor search. The idea here is that you embed the query and documents separately. So you can do them. You can basically embed all the documents um, offline or beforehand. And on the other side, there are higher latency, but generally higher quality approaches that pass both the query and document through a transformer together, allowing what can be called all funnel interaction. Um, so this is expensive because you're pretty much passing every token in the query and document through every layer of a transformer. Um, but when fine-tuned, it can be a very powerful signal. And then in the middle, there are some relatively newer approaches, such as late interaction. So this term was introduced by Omar Khattab and Mateza Zaharia from Stanford in their work on Colbert, or Colbert uh, which generates the relevant score by embedding the query, and then using cached embeddings for tokens from the last layer of a transformer for documents. And the idea here is basically that we can still approximate all-to-all -all interaction without passing each token in the query and document through each layer of a transformer by essentially caching the embeddings from the last layer of the document. And there's also other approaches to represent query document similarity on the spectrum, for example, using convolutional neural networks, but these are less commonly used now. Cool, so now that we've kind of established some terminology, um, given our experiences building our own search, we would have identified the following opportunities and challenges for the NLP and search community. So this is non-exhaustive, but generally rooted in the problems that we face. So we'll touch on, and this is gonna be me mostly just posing questions that we've been thinking about and how we think about these questions um, related to semantic search, combining classical and neural, uh, neural information retrieval, learning, benchmarking, multimodal search, and kind of the role of generative language models. So when it comes to semantic search, um, which again, we talked about earlier, uh, like our use of semantic search has raised the following question. So one is, how do we embed long documents effectively? So there are some models with larger token limits, but many models like BERT, for example, have 512 token limits. Um, so this is kind of something we need to grapple with, especially when we're trying to kind of do the best search we can do. So there's a couple of options here. So option one is we can represent the document with one vector, either by embedding the most representative text. This can be something like a title or some summary or merging vectors across chunks. Um, so this could be kind of chunking um, the document um, using you know, various techniques and then merging the vectors for them. Um, and then the option two is we can represent the document with n vectors where n can be the number of sentences or paragraphs in the document, for example. So option two is gonna be more expensive than option one, which brings us to our next kind of point and question, which is, how, did it, how do we navigate the trade-off between quality and cost? Um, and there's a bunch of different variables that drive costs, and we'll kind of go over a few of them. So one is the number of vectors. So the more vectors that you are going to index, the more expensive it'll be. Um, the second would be the size of the vectors. So the more dimensions that your vector has, the more expensive it's going to be as well. So for example, using 768 dimensional vectors will be more expensive than 396 dimensional vectors. And then lastly, this is kind of more of a, maybe like a hidden cost, but it actually does come into play would be the number of concurrent experiments. So oftentimes when we're kind of building search, we need to kind of experiment and benchmark it. And often we do need to index um, kind of all the documents into some type of semantic cluster in order to kind of have some way of experimenting quickly. And the number of concurrent experiments can also increase um, the cost by a certain factor. Which leads us to kind of the next question, which is what are the best methods for training embeddings and kind of experimenting here? Um, we find that fine tuning is often necessary in certain domains. Um, out of the box approaches work on some, but not all domains. And then when it comes to fine tuning, there's various ways to fine tune. Um, one method that kind of is neat is kind of fine tuning the query better and keeping the document a better static to reduce the amount of times we need to re-index a semantic cluster. Um, and then there's also some thorny questions around personalization at scale without breaking the bank and incorporating click signals. So kind of the next general topic would be around how do we combine classical and neural information retrieval? So how do we get the best of this lexical and semantic worlds? 
Um, so generally lexical and semantic search work quite well together as complements. Um, so again, lexical being kind of the more keyword-based approach and semantics being the approach that takes into account the semantics. So using like neural models, et cetera, for embedding documents. Um, but that said, there are some challenges when blending the results together. So one of them is how do we unify the features from different approaches? When we're doing lexical search, we're getting signals like BM25 scores. But when we do semantic search, we're often getting signals like vector similarity scores, often the output of kind of cosine similarity or dot product operations. Um, and then we kind of need to unify them somehow in order to do the re-ranking stage. So there are ways in which we can kind of retrieve semantic signals for the lexically retrieved documents and then the lexical signals for the semantically retrieved documents. But then again, this adds latency. So depending on your search application and your use case, that added latency may or may not be worth it. Um, which kind of brings us to kind of the next approach, which is heuristic re-ranking approaches. So the heuristic re-ranking approaches often work well, but we need to contextualize it to the domain and other factors. So for example, we could put all the semantic results at the beginning if we have a good model, a high threshold, and strong filters on our semantic cluster. Um, but there may also be situations which we know we should put at the end if we know keyword hits are relevant and we need to boost recall for more semantic queries. So this is often very common in e-commerce where if somebody searches for a specific product name, I mean, it's probably gonna be very precise and you wanna show that at the beginning, but oftentimes users will kind of use more ambiguous language, in which case using semantic search can help fill in and increase the recall overall uh, for the user. And then in what domains, and then I guess the next kind of thing is how do we adapt based on domain? So in what domains do keyword-based approaches thrive? And in what domains do semantic approaches thrive? We find that performance does differ across domains. So lexical search actually and classical information retrieval still works very well in particular domains, especially where users are kind of expecting and you know, they want to take advantage of keyword-based search. In fact, in some cases, they may find semantic search to be off-putting and decrease the quality of results. So it is kind of actually a little bit more nuanced than um, based on kind of the context in which you do use it. And then lastly, and this is kind of an interesting question that um, I definitely enjoy thinking about is how do we think about different underlying indexing economics? So on a per document basis, the cost can dramatically differ between um, like what should like be, between the semantic cluster and lexical search. Um, so this kind of leads to a question around what documents should be indexed into a semantic cluster and what documents should be in, indexed into like an inverted index. And what is the optimal strategy for combining them from the relevance perspective, but then also from the economic perspective, because if we're building actual search systems, we need to make sure that it kind of sustain itself. Yeah, and then I think that, so the next kind of topic is about learning. Um, so given what we've chatted about, we could theoretically get both neural signals and classical BM25 type signals from text, um, but documents often have non-textual signals, um, like basically the number of likes or some notion of popularity. Um, so how do we use LTR, which kind of stands for learning to rank approaches across various types of signals with low latency? Um, and then the second question is around how effective can transfer learning across domains be? Um, so there are open source models trained on billions of sentence pair examples, um, some of which are at least kind of through hugging face, as Sam kind of alluded to. And transfer learning works well, but when do we want to fine tune further? And additionally, to what extent can we transfer fine tune models across domains? So for example, legal and scientific domains and research domains. Like we're kind of still investigating a little bit how similar different domains might be. Um, and then the third question would be around how effective can multitask learning be in information retrieval? So there are various NLP tasks. So for example, there's tasks like query intent detection, slot filling, where you're trying to find relevant tokens in a query in order to kind of pass them through um, some type of other interface, as well as retrieval and re-ranking. Um, so to what extent can we share a base model and learn across tasks? So this notion of multitask learning and kind of using it um, is still, I think, very nascent in search, um, but quite interesting. Yeah, and then, you know, we've talked about learning a little bit, but without strong, strong benchmarks, we can't reliably evaluate different learning approaches we just discussed. So building strong benchmarks to evaluate search methods is very tricky, but critical for the development of robust, robust search systems. Um, we can't really go through every document in a corpus for every query to find and rank the best documents. So one approach is, you know, manually creating ground truth from automatically generated smaller candidate sets. So the question here is, how do we most efficiently incorporate and leverage humans in the loop? Um, so the idea is basically that, you know, if we're having humans um, spend time, annotate things, how do we make sure that we're best using the time of these humans? Uh, because, you know, humans are obviously A, time consuming and B, expensive. So another approach kind of involves using weekly supervised approaches to construct train and test sets. So the idea here would be to kind of use models to kind of label data and then train models on them. So this is kind of very inspired by a lot of recent research in weak supervision. And there's a lot of tools now around kind of weak supervision as well that I think uh, kind of can play very nicely into search. And then kind of the last thing is like we also have click signals. So we can take advantage of click signals from users. And click signals can be powerful. 
but we also need to think how to about how to like effectively use sparse and noisy click signals. And lastly, we'll touch on two more future facing yet important areas where search engines will need to continuously innovate. Um, so one topic is multimodal search. So search nowadays needs to surface results across modalities, whether it's text, image, videos, et cetera. And how do we search across multiple modalities at once? Um, embeddings and semantic search approaches described earlier will play a useful role here. Um, that we do have to come up with ways of effectively embedding different modalities in the same space. This can also be expensive, which kind of brings us to a question of to reduce cost and latency, how can we best use offline computation? Um, one simple example might be we can generate or crawl captions for images and videos and convert them into a simpler text problem. That's just one very simple example. But I think there's a lot of ideas around, you know, and, and work happening around offline computation um, as a way to kind of make this more feasible. And then lastly, generative language models. So we think a lot about what role generative language models play and generative models in general play in search, given the exciting advances in the space. So for text generation, we, for example, have Uwrite, which generates text, and we have CodeComplete as well as other code generation apps, which generate code. Um, and then there's also been a ton of advances in image generation with, for example, DALI, Stable Diffusion, and other generative image models kind of um, being created and developed at a kind of a breakneck pace right now. Um, but this kind of opens up another can of worms in terms of how do we track provenance of generated content? So generated results often don't allow for traceability to the same to the source material the same way that traditional web results do. Um, so this is kind of something that we're trying to grapple with right now. And we're trying to think about how do we mix generated content with more standard web results that users expect from search? Um, so yeah, so these are kind of a variety of topics that we think about. Um, and yeah, same to the next slide. And thanks for listening. Um, if you're interested in chatting about any of these topics, please reach out to us at u.com. And I think we'll now open it up to questions. Okay, uh, so you do have a few questions, uh, looks like eight in the Q&A, you can tackle them and uh, uh, participants can go enter your questions via the Q&A. And also, if you want to be enabled to ask your question live, you can use the Zoom raise hand feature and I will enable you. Uh, so you want to maybe start on the stuff that's in the Q&A? Uh, Sure. So the first question is, uh, how does u.com do semantic search at scale and which vector database is being used? Any relevant blogs we can refer to? I don't think we can specifically say exactly what we're using in our tech stack, but I, there is a number of different options for, um, for vector databases. As Sahil loves to say, there's really a knife fight in the space. So I think that some of the open source options that you can definitely look at for getting started are like Milvis, Vespa, WeV8, um, and Elasticsearch is starting to introduce approximate nearest neighbors as well into its search APIs. Um, and so I would definitely take a look at one of those kind of getting started documents. Um, and they, a lot of those give really great overviews. Um, anything I miss, Sahil? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good point. I think in generally at a high level. Um, so, and I think maybe we touched about on this a little bit at the end of the talk, but we do find semantic search to be very useful in certain domains. Um, I think that semantic search is still kind of um, both from like the like economic, but also the relevance perspective um, has a lot of pros, but also has a lot of cons. So we do think a lot about kind of when to best use it. Um, so I think it really depends a little bit on the situation. So I think it's a little bit more nuanced, but we do try to um, stay kind of up to date and improve relevance um, as much as we can. Yeah, I think that really tactical example there is like if you're searching for pizza in Detroit, for example, um, you might get very high semantic hits for pizza in New York, but you probably don't want to service those results, um, even though there probably is a very high semantic similarity to, between those queries. You're probably looking for exactly pizza in Detroit, because that's all where you are. Um, second question, how is u.com different from DuckDuckGo? Do you want to take this one, Sahil? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think that we're kind of taking our own stand, like our own approach to search. Um, a lot of it is kind of based on, if you use our interface, you'll kind of see it's very different in terms of how it looks, but we have this idea of apps within u.com and eventually we're kind of coming up with this idea of the open platform where other people can kind of add their own apps to u.com. So we're really trying to create like a open system. Um, but like DuckDuckGo, we do kind of respect DuckDuckGo's stance on privacy and we kind of strive to, you know, be private as well. You know, I think DuckDuckGo is also a great product. Um, yeah, and you know, they have a very strong focus on privacy, which is kind of like also been inspirational for us. Yeah. And then I uh, think next, in, oh, oh, go for it. Go ahead. You can go ahead. 
So it says, how do you evaluate the search results? Do you have a set of test queries? What is the measure being used? Um, so in terms of how we evaluate such results, um, we can't go into too much detail about exactly how we construct the set of test queries, but I can talk about some of the measures. I think we're very uncreative right now when it comes to kind of measuring search. We're kind of using a lot of the standard benchmarks. So for example, these are kind of things like precision at five, precision at 10, NDCG, recall, um, F1, um, kind of F1, you know, optimized for specific domains where we care more about precision versus recall. So I think we do kind of use a lot of the standard metrics. Um, and then we do kind of, and I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, later in, later in the talk where we talked about benchmarking, we think about, you know, how can we make this as efficient as possible? Because um, labeling for information retrieval is kind of kind of tricky. So we think about how we can use humans as effectively as possible. Um, we partner with kind of other external evaluation companies as well to make sure we have kind of like objective evaluations on like a quarterly and monthly basis. So that's kind of the stand and the approach we're taking. Great. Uh, next question I can take. Um, how do you use your data lake to improve off the shelf models for personalized search? Um, so I think that the, we, we use a data lake largely because it has kind of like a seamless integration into Apache Spark, which is where we do a lot of model training and, uh, data set curation and our ETL process kind of blended all together. Um, I think that that is usually kind of like decreased the amount of glue in between each of those jobs, specifically how the data lake helps, um, as to improving off the shelf models for personalized search. I think that. Um, you can, there's a, there's a, a number of different techniques in this space. So using click signals to bring semantic similarities of, of documents together can kind of help you fine tune Aquarium better as, um, Sahil, Sahil was saying, um, kind of keeping your document in better static while tuning your Aquarium better, or that's kind of like the, the learning to retrieve, um, methodology. There's also other kind of models that you can augment your, um, your uh, NLP models with, like uh, specifically around like HRNNs or behavior sequence transformers, which specifically aim to like uh, model sequences of clicks and user behavior. And then you can usually uh, ensemble those models together to kind of tweak personalized results with um, uh, retrieve, uh, standard retrieval methods. But again, there's there's trade-offs there where you, you need to know how to balance those two types of models where you don't want to give someone an irrelevant result because it's very similar to what they've clicked on in the past. And at the same time, you don't want to miss out on things that um, really fits the user's persona um, while not being the most relevant. Hit. So there's a, there's a trade-off there. Um, the go ahead. Yeah. The next question is, do you use the transform models for feature extraction for retrieval only? Or do you also use transformers for the re-ranking problem? And yeah, this is a, this is a good question. So we talked about kind of um, at least you know in terms of a lot of the neural advances um, having effect on both the retrieval and re-ranking side of things. So we try to kind of use it where it makes sense. Um, again, it kind of depends on the specific task and domain we're kind of encountering. But we do use transformers for kind of re-ranking as well. And we think about how we can use it. But I think one thing to say about re-ranking is. Um, we do care a lot about latency. So as a search engine, latency is quite important to us. Um, if you kind of have, depending on your latency constraints, you may or may not be able to kind of really use a lot of powerful models. So for example, there was a recent paper out where they used T5 for re-ranking. And I think they showed that it significantly improved the results. Um, and again, that probably adds more latency and it, maybe it's okay for some cases, maybe not for others, but we're also thinking about how we can kind of make this as fast as possible. If you're interested in reading more about that, um, there's a lot of awesome talks about like the cascade system, which is usually like BM25 retrieval systems, which cascade into a, a BERT re-ranking system. Um, so I would definitely uh, encourage you to go read about some of those. And again, learning to retrieve is really great in that space as well. Uh, next question is, does u.com have the search by voice feature? I think the answer is no. Yeah, the answer is no right now. The answer is no. Um, how do you deal with the problems of re-indexing documents that change very frequently? I'll, that's a hell question. Yeah, this is a this is a great question, um, and this is this is a tough one because um, you know re-indexing documents very frequently has kind of two. There's really two things that we have to think about. So one is latency on the overall system. So oftentimes 
when you re-index into a cluster, it can slow down search. Um, so we're still thinking about how we can best create setups where we can still re-index frequently, but keep search kind of very fast. So that's kind of one challenge. And then the second one is um, around kind of cost. And, you know, we can, you know, we have data pipelines, but as Sam mentioned, like these data pipelines, we have to keep them running, they cost some amount. So we have to think a little bit about um, that as well. So basically the answer is that we really try to look at the user and all the choices we make are rooted in what we think is necessary to create the best experience for the user. So for example, for maybe like news cases, we may want to re-index very frequently. So if there's, for example, some trending search happening, we want to make sure that we are able to capture that. But for many cases, like for some documents, um, they don't really change that often. And these corpuses, it's okay for them to be re-indexed a lot less frequently. So we try to just basically root it in what we think will best help our users kind of be more efficient. Yeah. I think there's also ways to get around that around kind of ignoring some fields like you, but this becomes very domain specific and, and take some hand handwritten rules for, for example, upvotes on certain documents might be able to be ignored if you're not using them for popularity signals and your retrieval or ranking. And in that case, you can kind of like not re-index those, and so, but that again, takes a human in the loop to kind of write that code. Um, the top question right now is, you mentioned semantic search. Do you use any semantic enrichment, knowledge graph, and KG embeddings to enable semantic search capabilities? Um, I'm not super sure what semantic enrichment is, um, but we do kind of use transformer models to add things like um, add, add things we, we know about the, the underlying query for, for those types of um, for that types of data. And we do, as, as Sahil alluded to, we do have things like um, uh, programming language filtering within the U code, which uh, is some uh, semblance of um, knowing the semantic uh, programming language, I guess you'd say. And we do, we do enrich our documents like that. Yeah, and I think you mentioned schema.org. So yeah, we do think schema.org is pretty neat. Um, so that's kind of very useful, especially at the parsing stage for parsing documents. So we, I guess yeah. we do a little bit of, depending on how you define semantic enrichment. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, semantic enrichment, an example could be extending the search to syn synonyms. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, see, so I think we, yeah, like basically like types of query expansion, et cetera. Yeah, we, we think a lot about that. So we do, um, yeah, we do, I guess in that case, think about how we can best, you know, transform the query, expand it, et cetera. Um, there are, yeah, unique uh, flavors of challenges over there, um, but yeah. I think it's a important topic. Yeah, the question has a few other parts to use knowledge graph. We do have notions of kind of like having metadata stores that we can kind of match on, which is sort of like your knowledge graph. Uh, for scaling out, um, could you have replaced Spark with Kafka using streaming technologies like Beam and Flink? You could. I think that's a really good call out if you wanted to do like real time indexing or, or real time inference if you had like streaming crawlers and then you have streaming inference jobs. You can you can definitely conceptualize your data lake as a Kafka stream and that that batch ETL could become a streaming ETL and then running that model in a streaming fashion could not, you could definitely do something like that. If you do it, you should definitely hit me up. I love uh, beam and flink and all those technologies so I would love to see something like that. And for neighbor search, did you consider tools like phase or milvis as for vector searching? Did we, Sahil? Yeah, it's, uh, so we can't comment too much on the specific tools we're using. But yeah, I mean, we definitely looked at kind of all the options. So there's, as, as like I think we alluded to, there's a lot of very good open source options right now, um, as well as like companies that have focused on this. I think Sam had mentioned a few, like WeV8, Pinecone, um, milvis. Uh, face. Um, I know Anoy is another library. So there's like a ton of, there's like a, yeah, there's a lot going on in this space. And yeah, we've definitely, I think our philosophy in general is we want to kind of, we're a small company. So we want to kind of build where it makes sense, but also um, partner where it makes sense. And that's kind of how we go about things. Cool. Um, I think the next one is another, Another Sahel question, it looks like. How do you solve the search term highlight problem in with regard to semantic search, since the query and the terms in the document may be expressed differently? Yeah, so the search term. So I assume what this question is referring to is highlighting a snippet from the result. Um, so I guess 
it says since the query and the terms in the document may be yeah so i guess okay so this yeah so if we were to do this um so yeah i think over here it's i, I would almost consider this to be kind of a second problem like a different problem so if there was like a, a pipeline right we've talked about retrieval re-ranking i would consider what you know i guess shachi is referring to a search term highlight it's kind of like a third set in the pipeline so there are models like QA models, et cetera, that we could use to kind of pick up the most relevant terms. Um, uh, so like a very simple approach would just be, okay, you look at the terms in the query and then you just highlight them. But obviously as you, as the you know qu uh, questioner mentioned, um, there's some differences there. So in that case, we'd probably wanna use um, like basically fancier models and take advantage of some of the research over there. Uh, next one. Thank you for the answering talk. Very welcome uh, from Shabnam. Uh, how long can the query be? And you have a special way to chunk your documents. Do you have a publication? How long is your longest docs? Um, you want to take this one? Yeah. So, I mean, queries can be really long. So in the case of programming queries, I think they can be like, for example, imagine you had an error message that could be an extremely long query. Um, so there's really, yeah, so we do have to take into account, um, you know, long queries as well as short queries. Um, and do we have a special way to chunk our documents? Um, so I think there's like definitely many different ways to chunk our documents. Um, I don't know if I would say any of them are particularly special, but I mean, I think a lot of it sometimes like things are just naturally chunked. And the best situation is in which the data that we're searching over, it has a natural chunk to it in some ways. So for example, this can be based on the structure of the web page itself. But obviously if that's not the case, there are ways, I know there's like, you know, HMM type approaches using like hidden markup models to kind of do it as well as there's also other approaches that kind of look at kind of where natural breaking points are to chunk. Um, we don't have a publication. And then how long is your longest docs? So our longest docs can be very long. So for example, we have a Stack Overflow app that you can use and you can actually see with, if you if you look up like a coding question, and you click open side panel, you can see kind of a lot of the information that we have indexed ourselves. Um, in the Stack Overflow app itself. And you can see that these are not only questions, but also a lot of answers from different users. Um, so they can be quite long. Um, next question is, what is the most effective document embedding in your experience? I think the answer to that one is largely going to be, it depends. Um, as, as Sahil said, we see that the performance of a lot of these methodologies changes based on the domain. And so really the, the only way to, to kind of figure that out is to curate some sort of benchmark data set and try different ones and see um, what kind of different arrangement of indexing different parts of the vector and how you actually create the um, vectors out of the document improves the performance. So I don't think that there is like a hard and fast rule for that. Um, I think that for, if you look at the source code for like the hugging face fe feature extraction, you're gonna see them use something similar to what you said around kind of mean pooling at the top of the head of the transformer uh, for the vector. So I think there's another question. Do you cache your search queries to improve latency? Um, so yeah, we've explored caching. Um, you know, I think search in some ways is a problem that there are a lot of unique queries, so we definitely don't try to depend on that. Like hard coding things does sometimes sometimes work well, but um, yeah, I mean we've we've definitely explored you know various caching solutions. We do care a lot about latency for our users and are always trying to improve there. Cool. Next question: How do you balance personalization via apps versus privacy? I love this question. Um, I think that we try not to we try to have opinions, but we try not to do the balancing ourselves and instead give the user tons of tools to do the balancing themselves. For example, we have things like you can use different map uh, solutions. If you don't want Google to have kind of your location data, you can do things like only use our private mode if you don't aren't interested in any telemetry or us improving the results based on your, your clicks. I think that Largely, we give you the tools that the, some of the larger companies, because uh, it would impact their ad revenue, uh, never would. So we kind of give you the tools to personalize the results as you wish. Um, or if you really value your privacy, you can do without it. Um, and so that's kind of, we allow the user to make that trade off instead of having a uh, dictating and prescribing one rule to all of our users. Do 
use knowledge graphs and if you do so how do you use it with neural retrieval yeah i guess that's a that's an interesting question so we talked a little bit about um, knowledge graphs um, and yeah i think that is a very active area of research um, we have explored this um, and we we do think a lot about where knowledge graphs make sense so for example some things naturally are knowledge graphs so for example like if you look at um, like entity search and you're kind of trying to learn about somebody like Barack Obama there's a lot of like you know properties there and knowledge graphs make sense um, and then combining it with neural retriever I think there are ways in which we can um, kind of retrieve those knowledge graphs um, but yeah I, I don't know if we can go too much into detail on that yet I think another really good spot for them is going to be for your query expansion tasks so if you have a knowledge graph and you get a hit in it and you have a number of metadata fields, you can attempt to, within latency constraints, use those metadata pieces that you get from the knowledge graph to do subsequent retrievals to enrich the results that you're presenting. So those are a number of different ways you could use knowledge graph with uh, neural retrieval. So it says the data sets that these models are targeting at are mainly search queries. The zoo.com index documents being searched. Um, so, Yes, this is a yeah maybe I'm not fully understanding the question but I'll take a stab at it um so when we the data sets that these models are targeting are at, are mainly being searched. yeah so we are targeting I mean we are a search company so most of our like we are focused on what like user search queries might be and that's kind of where we're starting off so we really want to make sure that we have um you know apps that best help the user so right now I think one of our in some ways we can think of this like a niche search engine uh, is UCode. So UCode is a search engine for developers. So in that case, Stack Overflow, um, you know, MDN, uh, Geeks for Geeks, PyTorch documentation, Hugging Face documentation, these are all kind of data sets that we would index. And then it says, have you thought about getting feedback from users to measure the relevance of search results? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. Um, I know Sam probably has a lot of thoughts. If you look at each of the apps, we do have a thumbs up, thumbs down button. So we're trying to definitely allow users to provide their feedback. Um, and yeah, it's definitely, and again, this would be in our personalization, like personal mode. So in private mode, um, we definitely make sure that we kind of don't kind of store click signals, et cetera, because we do want to take and respect users' privacy. But in the personal mode, we do try to use feedback. And I'll, I'll hand it off to Sam. Um, yeah, so I think that we get a lot of, so if you know in, uh, personalization algorithm algorithms, there's kind of like a difference between explicit evidence and implicit evidence. We allow the users to kind of give very explicit evidence for personalization via thumbs up and thumbs down, which we use as very hard rules in, in ranking. And then we also use click signals as kind of our implicit evidence. Um, but I think that largely we kind of, we gauge via um, just the amount of, the amount of uh, people who use the website as kind of large north stars for how we're doing um yeah so says, go ahead so one of them says if the embedding size is very large what methodology do you use to reduce its size apart from using a smaller model for semantic search um and you know this would be techniques like quantization and sam kind of talked about the optimum library so yeah i'll let you kind of go into more um, so we, we don't do anything right now to kind of reduce the size. I think you could use pretty standard things like, um, PCA or auto encoders to do your kind of dimensionality reduction, pretty standardized tools. Um, but one thing that you're going to keep in mind that you have to keep in mind is that reducing those, reducing the dimensions is going to mean re-indexing. And so if you want to do dimensionality reduction, um, you're going to want to think about that up front because it's a real hassle to try and re-index billions and billions of documents. Um, I think that it really goes, I think that what you alluded to is probably your best bet, which is to to use the correct size model and to try and get away with the the smallest, with the the least um, features extracted as possible, um, and to use that instead of going going big to start. I would go small and then improve until your search results kind of taper off. You're not getting anything better in your benchmarks, and then stop. 
Um, Ed asks, were all challenges with Spark related to parallelism and partition slash shuffling strategies? If not, what were some of the other challenges you encountered? Yeah, so I think that long running jobs and timeouts related to kind of driver doing health checks on workers can be a challenge, especially if you have jobs that run for days. Um, and so I think that those are kind of tuning tuning the, the number of partitions that you have. And so kind of using those rules of thumb of keeping partitions between uh, 250 megabytes and a gigabyte is really good. Um, but also just trying to figure out, I think some of our auto scaling uh, issues were also pretty challenging, uh, figuring out how to auto scale and when to do that versus just kind of like eating costs up front or eating costs by uh, wall clock time. It says, how do you measure relevancy for you.com? Any methodology or tool recommendations? Um, yeah, this is, this is a great question. So I think that um, we definitely do think a lot about measuring relevancy. Uh, these are some of the approaches kind of mentioned in the benchmarking. So again, one being, can we kind of use like other, basically other, can we somehow get a smaller set of documents? Um, this could be either using kind of our own approaches and then kind of using humans to re-rank them. So I think that measuring relevancy is one of those things where we do find that humans are still useful. So we definitely do rely on kind of most efficiently using humans in the loop. Um, but at the same time, it is also good to have automated approaches that we can very quickly do to keep iterating fast. Any methodology or tool recommendations? Yeah, I think the, um, I guess the main, I guess the methodology would be to try to make sure that if humans are annotating, um, we're, you're doing it in a way that makes it so that those test sets last. So for example, it might be really easy to come up with like a human task where they look at your search results and then they just simply say whether or not it's good or bad. So that's kind of a very expensive use of humans because it's kind of specific to the results you provided. So if you kind of all model, like if you altered your algorithm, you would basically need to re kind of use humans again to kind of see how it's benchmarked. So coming up with like independent sets and then allowing yourselves to generate different approaches and then benchmarking, that's like the broader methodology that I, I would recommend. Um, tool recommendations. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, honestly, I think we've also kind of spent some time building our in-house tools. Um, I, I, I don't know, like there are, yeah, I guess when it comes to relevancy, I think a lot of it is really more in the labeling than the tool. I don't know if the tool is really bottleneck, at least for us. Delicious question says, what is your source of funding or revenue? Um, that's a good question. So I think right now we have, uh, we've announced our series A. Um, so we have kind of uh, different investors. So we've had, yeah, that's basically our source of funding. Um, and then revenue, we're still thinking strongly about how to produce revenue. So right now we have no ads. Um, and we you know, thought a little bit about um, how we can kind of partner and really enable people to kind of monetize search through the open platform. So how do you create, oh, sorry, go for it, Sam. Do you want to no, take, you take it away says, okay, I'll start with the second one. How does your IR approach understand the semantics of the data being searched for because all your approaches are limited to ML probabilistic base, which is only going to be limited to data um, information, but not into knowledge. So personalization semantic search will all be fairly limited. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, it definitely, I think the approaches that we described are not taking into account uh, personalization, um, but I think there are ways of doing it. And I think one way, this one area this could live would be, there's different diff different areas where it could live but a lot of it will probably live in the re-ranking stage. So when we re-rank, we can probably take into account a lot of the users, like knowledge about the user. Um, but then at the retrieval stage, that's also an interesting place, but it becomes a little bit more expensive because then you need to kind of think about how to index things per user. Um, and that's kind of more of a, probably very interesting, but probably more of an expensive route to go down. So a lot of it can be done at the re-ranking stage. But again, yeah, this is kind of a good call out. Um, and we are gen developing like search for, for many users right now. And we do think a lot about personalization, but yeah, this is definitely probably a limitation with kind of the IR research in general is how do we best use personalization? It's kind of an open question. Cool, last question. How do you create your data sets to use some kind of tool like HiCal or is it semi-automated using click signals? Um, we create our data sets largely using Apache Spark. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking as far as our ETLs go. 
Um, we don't use, uh, I'm not familiar with this tool, HiCal. Um, and we have a number of different ways that we, we get labels um, via kind of like as uh, Sahel had said before, a number of heuristics that we've developed. Um, we use click signals. And then there's obviously the, uh, the human in the loop. You can go get humans uh, to label your data for you. So I think that those are largely how, how that's done. And now the new last question. Um, do you have any fine-tuned domain-specific models in production now? Um, not sure if we can get into specifics around that. Um, I think we, we do fine-tune models, we do perform transfer learning, and we do put them in production. And we do also think about domain-specific approaches. So as we mentioned, we talked about like kind of the different domains that we're thinking about, whether it's research or programming. So yeah, I would say we do have domain specific um, approaches in mind, but yeah, I think Sam kind of covered the rest. Okay, hey, well, that's it for the questions that have been answered. I warned you guys uh, when we talked yesterday that uh, the, the really engaging talks get a lot of questions and you had a lot of questions, which is great. Uh, so thanks very much for your talk. Any parting words based on what people were asking you or things that came to mind after you finished your presentation? If not, I will thank you once again, Sam and Sahil, for the presentation.